thank you so much for having me. It's, I'm so excited to be here and kind of go back to my roots um, with, you know, growing up raising beef cattle and having the blog Food and Swine kind of came about, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit uh, after I made a pork burger that made me almost $20,000. So I kind of thought, you know, hey, I'll, I'll talk about the recipes, and it just was kind of, we raised pigs, it all worked out, uh, but with the title, I feel like this is divine intervention. The title of your conference, Share Your Story, I've really been, this, this year it's been tugging at me to want to kind of go back to my roots, talk a little bit more about beef production, and, uh, you know, kind of move your guys' story ahead a little bit, because I focus so much on pigs, it's good to diversify, and it's very interesting to me, and um, my folks have cow-calf semi-angus in uh, Prairie City, Iowa, 50 head of cows. My brother-in-law and my sister have 350 angus cows in Monroe, Iowa, and they also have bucking bulls. So my brother-in-law cowboys everything on horseback. My dad is that modern farmer with the four-wheeler. <laughs> if there's a pasture that cannot have four-wheeler access, we are not going to be in it. He's, uh, and you'll see him a lot. He would be horrified to know that he's, you know, a kind of front and center in my presentation, as would my brother-in-law. But, uh, you know, I'm encouraging them to kind of, you know, step out and share their story because obviously that's important. If I had the skillet or the frying pan going and we were hearing and smelling more, there would be even more people coming. But it was a little warmer in here this morning, so I'm going to run through my little presentation about sharing my story um, and maybe ask you and encourage you to do the same for your industry that I'm kind of doing with pork. All right? So if you, is anyone on social media? Anybody? Okay. So I want to ask just really quick because I'm kind of greedy and want the knowledge. What number one social media are you on? What's most important to you? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, where are you at? I want to know. Facebook? Is Facebook at the top? Twitter, anybody? Twitter? Lots of ag people on Twitter. Okay, Instagram, anybody? That's kind of an up-and-comer, but it's awesome. All right, go ahead. Miss Carrie Horman, now, I don't even know your last name. <laughs> Carrie and I grew up, I went to a lot of cattle shows with a friend who my dad farmed with. I met Carrie when we were very, very young and she's going to help me with my presentation today. So forgive me if I have to give her a little grief. I just haven't seen her for a long time, and I will call her by her maiden name all day. Okay? <laughs> Carrie, it just doesn't feel right in my mouth. I will answer to you. All right, so just a brief rundown. This is my family, my side of the family. This is my sister, Tana, and, and Drew, who is... I think, you know, kind of like the Clint Eastwood cowboy, very typical man's man. This is my husband, the pig farmer, and these are my children, and that is Kemper, who belongs to Tana and Drew, um, and then my mom and dad. So my dad had, and I, sometimes I don't tell this part of the story. Being a female, and I, I see a lot of us in the audience, and farming or being on the farm, being in ag, sometimes, you know, gets the questions or there's just not, not all the feel goods. It's not expected that you're going to come back to farm. And one thing I tell people, and hopefully you don't know my family, so you won't know who this is, but my uncle actually asked me one day, do you, don't you think your dad wishes he had boys? Is that like the worst thing you have ever heard in your life? <laughs> like, What? And, and at the time, it's kind of funny, you know, you kind of think sporty, whatever. I played college softball. My sister played college basketball, was a thousand point scorer. We are working back on the farm yet. This guy asked me who I'm related to, who is my blood. When one of his children is in jail at the time, don't you think he wish he would have had boys? So, no, I say no. Um, and he, you know, my dad is just at the helm of our family you know, with, within ag, my sister and I help plant and harvest corn and soybeans on 1,200 acres, and uh, it's, that's my favorite time of the year. I'm sure most of you would 
agree, harvest is always, harvest is that thing, you know, when, when you happen to lose someone or you're, or you're always thinking, I, just make it to the next harvest. I just want one more harvest. You know, that, that is one of those things that makes me almost emotional to think about. But when you are going to tell your story, invoking some of that emotion onto the consumer who wants to hear this information from you, these two ladies in the front who are obviously representatives of Cattlemen's and Iowa Beef, the best people you could have to help you do this. The consumer doesn't want to hear from them anymore. They're the experts. They say, you know, we're good. We, we want to know what, what do you think about when you're raising cattle? Is it important to you to leave a legacy for your family, your children? Next slide. All right, so then, you know, there's the grain farming. My son is such a good sport. He will appear in quite a few of my social media posts. Come on in. Hi. Uh, as he's a uh, picture candy, he does a lot of uh, lip syncing on Snapchat. So if you are on Snapchat, find me. You will see him lip syncing a lot to all of the popular um, pop music of the time. But he's, he's my ride-along buddy. Go ahead and go to the next one. What's up? You good? All right. Okay. So growing up, we did have the cattle. I, I just wanted to put that in there. This is my dad who never wants me to take a picture of him, would be horrified if he even knew he was up here. I'm going to have lunch with him, and I know he's going to ask me what happened. And there will probably be social media up. He goes and checks on my blog because I have my social little channels that go on the side, and he'll say, put a picture of me up. You did. And I say, yeah, sorry, get over it. We need it. We have to have it. He doesn't have a smartphone. He has a flip phone, and he, he can't even figure that out. So we're just not going to go there. Go ahead and flip me to the next one. So obviously we have pigs. That's a huge part of our life, working with the pork producers, NPPC, NPB, Iowa Pork, is a big um, motivation for me so we can make the consumer more comfortable with what we're doing, not only what we're doing, showing them what we're doing, but why we do it. Go ahead. So then part of my journey kind of comes back to being a competitive cook and baker. The Iowa State, does anyone go to the Iowa State Fair? Does anyone not go to the Iowa State Fair? So com super competitive, college softball player, works for WHO radio, quits her job to have her children, stays at home, goes nuts, right? <laughs> no way to vent that competitive energy. So I started cooking and baking for contests at the Iowa State Fair and then kind of moved up to more of a national level. And this is, um, so the pork burger was the $15,000 prize and then the people's choice was a little more than that. And that kind of propelled me into thinking, man, uh, maybe I should put my recipe somewhere because when I was at church or, oh, God, preschool roundup, the last straw was in the pedicure chair. Do, do you think I could get that biscuit recipe? Do that biscuit recipe, you know, the one, you know, when you're getting a pedicure, do you really want anyone to talk to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> want to chill. I just want to relax. So I was having three by five index cards, you know, I'm writing these recipes down. So then I thought, I'm going to start a food blog. I want to talk about food. I want to write about food. It's important to me. Being in the kitchen is important to me. My whole motivation was to kind of bring back family in the kitchen. But, go ahead to the next one. So I started the food blog. Everything was going well. And then I needed to kind of be full disclosure with everyone and talk a little bit, bit about what we really do or just become a person with my readers. So much of what we do. Hi, Ryan. This is my cousin's husband, Ryan. Sorry, I introduce everybody that comes in. Okay, I, I will. <laughs> he just was just at my house the other day. Um, so I go and write the food blog. And I'm telling my readers, you know, more about my life. And then unintentionally, I become what some people consider an advocate or an advocate for modern ag just through telling those stories in a softer way. Not every time Subway comes out with an announcement I'm writing, don't even listen to this. No, let's, let's just show people what really happens on farms. 
talk about why our food is safe and, and the steps we take on our farms to ensure that, the care that we give our animals. They don't care how much you know. They don't. They want to know how much you care. How much do you care about raising safe food? Happy animals make safe food. Okay. Go ahead in the next one, Carrie. Thank you. So I always ask people around um, me at these conferences, I want you to consider the people around you who are not hooked into agriculture at all. Consider them where they get their news, mostly on the internet, right? What do you see when you're scrolling through Facebook that just gets you? If I need a blood pressure jazz in the morning, you know, because I kind of have low BP, I just go on Facebook and, you know, just start looking around. It's terrible. Um, this is Mandy. She actually owns the gym that I go to. She's an amazing woman. I had her out um, and her children. They all got to drive a tractor for the first time. We were in pig barns, and we went out and saw my dad's cows. She's a wonderful person. In the CrossFit community, the gym that I go to, a lot of paleo, free range. I'm a supporter of all meat. All, I'm an equal opportunity meat enthusiast, okay? But there's definitely people in my gym that have uh, different standards in their mind of what quality is. Welcome. Come on in. Go ahead, Carrie. So think about those people just for a little bit. Think about them. Do they ever get a chance to see you like this? Do they get a chance to see those small moments that are forever burned in your memory as important and meaningful and the stuff that, like right now, that makes the hair stand up on your back when you really think about your life and what you do, farming, ranching, raising cattle, and how important that is to the legacy that your grandparents, great-grandparents left for you, but that you will leave for your children, your grandchildren, and so on. Do they ever get to see that? Go ahead, we'll go to the next one. No, they get to see the food babe talking about what she deems important to gain followers, to sell marketing packages like Dr. Oz does and slay people like you and I who are making safe, affordable food. Okay? She, she tackled the, what was it, the bread ingredient that's also an ingredient in yoga mats. It's actually a dough conditioner, but it just happens to also be in yoga mats. Terrible idea, Subway, whatever. She won. And now she's on her tirade about antibiotics in the meat you eat because you know there's antibiotics in there right there's no withdrawal time right oh there is what the people that you're thinking of would they know would they know and and how would you attempt to break through to try to tell them this it's not always with a blog post that's kind of defensive no it's just continuing to steadily show and promote, you know, the message of what you do on the daily. What, in the hard work and sometimes the struggle or the sacrifice that you make, it all, go, it all comes together to be able to strengthen our message. Just in, from pigs to cattle, whatever. Modern production ag, man, there's just fire bombs being cast everywhere at us. But... I never want the opportunity for a single mom to go to Walmart, Hy-Vee, Fairway, and buy a dozen eggs for $1.88. I never want that to go away. But the people that are making some of these decisions are going to ensure that our prices go up. And then, then we have a food crisis. We are so food secure that everyone can kind of sit back and whine about it. I don't want to whine about it. They're not doing the work. We got to show them. Okay, go ahead. So, sell the fear, spread the misinformation. No one's, Twitter might slap you on the hand a little bit. Oh, you know, big deal. Facebook, it's a post. Oh, it's free speech. But you have free speech too. Go ahead. So, as an industry, and this is really common 
and I, this is my husband in our pig barns, and I just think it's such a serious looking picture, that's why I put it up here for this. Um, a picture of the back of my dad's head overlooking his cattle really wasn't like suitable for this, so I thought, you know, we'll go with pigs. But as an industry, we do rely on science to make our decisions on our farms, okay? But how, uh, how do people receive messages that are littered with statistics. Do you like to see that? A bunch of percentages, a bunch of pie charts? No. Okay, go ahead. And Dr. Wendy Winterstein, does anyone know Dr. Winterstein from Iowa State University? She gave uh, one of the opening statements at Iowa Swine Day this past June. And this will haunt me forever. Science is worthless without adequate communication. But the communication that the consumer is telling us through surveys, through science, is that they want to hear it from their peers. They don't want to hear it from these people. These people get paid to say what we think that they are, should say for us. And it's very 1980s, 90s to say, the checkoff group takes care of that. It's not on me. My dad's still like that. But the consumer says, but we want to know what really happens. Well, they're going to tell you what really happens, but no, they're getting paid to do that. So it goes, the, the job shift, I believe, for people like these two is to be able to help us tell our story. And that's what this whole conference is about, is it not? And it's easier than you think. It really is. And you're so lucky to have the people that you do in your corner to be able to help you tell your story. Go ahead. Because, as you know, all those people that you're thinking of, all the people around you, many of them, many of them, I mean, what, 4%, 2% of people are actually farming today? You're such a minority. But it doesn't take that many people to really carry a message. Generations off of the farm. This is my dad. This is ground that's been in my family. I feel like, you know, I could just touch it for 146 years. So he would also be horrified if he knew that he was in another picture. But he's just kind of uh, an easy person to put. He's six foot nine inches tall. So that's probably another reason. He hates horses, refuses horses, on, you know, oh my gosh. Let's just not even go there. Horses and chicken. My dad, uh-uh. No. No horses, no chicken. But yeah, so we're generations off the farm. Everyone, mostly everyone you encounter on a daily do they even have a connection back to the farm? No. All right, go ahead. So with my food blog, we're also kind of generations out of the kitchen. I mean, who do you know that is really around, in my early 20s, I wanted to bake pies, bake breads, dinner rolls, cinnamon rolls, everything from scratch. There's not a ton of people that want to do that. I was lucky, had the time, so I did. But they are also generations out of the kitchen. Go ahead. Oh, this, that was, I was teaching some little kids how to uh, bake. I have a baking school at my house, a little private baking school. So that, that's one of the most fun things that I've done that kind of ties in with my blog is give lessons to kids. So that consumer, who, who can they trust? Who can they trust? Who do they want to trust? Who do they want to see? Their peers. Like I said, peers are more credible to the consumer. Through surveys, we found that out. This is actually a picture. I was in North Carolina at Prestige Farms, a really big hog operation down in North Carolina. We took these bloggers, very influential bloggers from all around the US, uh, took them on a tour of all the modern pig facilities. And then we, the next day, we actually toured the Smithfield plant in Clinton. And they saw the kill floor and the processing and then they all went back and wrote about it. So earned media that these people help you guys get from bloggers like this or people like me. Because I'll write about this day today too. Earned media is worth five to 10 times more than paid media. And earned media to me still is a picture of you in your feed yard with your children. A picture <coughs> of cows in a pasture looking comfortable and you telling people you know your grass-fed beef well really all beefs grass-fed and you know kind of going through that 
argument as well. And this, uh, the Iowa Food and Family Project is something that Iowa, Iowa Beef Industry Council sponsors that, correct? Not Cattlemen's, it's, it's you guys. Mm -hmm. Yep, so we put this little cookbook together and I'm out, otherwise I would have <laughs> brought some for you guys uh, to at least to see. Uh, we go to farmers markets, lots of different events, Iowa State Fair to kind of connect with the consumer and having that tangible piece of, well, something that's pretty cool, you know, a free cookbook. People will say, are you sure it's free? You know, no, I don't want the blood of your unborn child. Like, it's free, take it. And just making a connection and earning their trust so maybe they come back to look for that peach pie recipe, but also see our kids with the pigs in the nursery, things like that. Go ahead. So this is where I say, man, Farmers are needed to tell the story. You're going to hear that a thousand times this weekend, but I mean it. And I think it, it is where our industry is going. It's what we need to do. It's what we need to do to preserve our right to farm the way that we need to, want to, and know how to farm to make the best product have the quality that I know that we raise in our barns every day. So this is Crystal Blinn from crystalcattle.com. I just love her. She is a total cattle girl. She is awesome. She loves turquoise in makeup, which I love that too. So she has a great blog. This is my brother-in-law, Drew. This is Clint Eastwood. He would die if he knew that this was up. But you know, when you send me pictures of yourself, I'm going to use them. I think he kind of plants them in my inbox so maybe I could use them a little bit and I do so a lot of uh, the cattle stuff that I don't take myself is actually pictures from him go ahead and, and why why do we need you to tell your story to be able to preserve the right to farm and the to gain the trust of consumers to keep them you know not only sharing your live animal story okay but also your product usage. I mean, if you say, well, I'm not really with the cattle. Well, do you cook? Do you bake? Do you use beef products? You know, that's all part of the story that I am tasking you to share. But this is why we do it. So we can have these moments and continue to allow. What really, what in your life means as much as something like this? Is there anything, anything more in your entire life that would mean more than a picture of you with your grandkids showing them what you love and what's important to you and teaching them the morals and principles of being a good stockman. Is there anything more important than that? I, I just really don't think so. Go ahead. So this is where I kind of talk about what will connect you with the consumer. And this is kind of where my blog, being that unintentional advocate, <sighs> lent me to softly tell this story, have people coming to my site for recipes, but leaving with a grasp, a further grasp of what's going on in modern production ag. And it's not those icky vegan memes that you see all the time or things of Dr. Oz or people who share that have never had a pair of coveralls on, never worn a pair of boots, ever. So what connects you to the people we talked about earlier? What connects you? How can you, what shared values do you have? Do you have children? Okay, so let's go to the next one. Because shared values are important. Like I said earlier, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. All right? So the confidence, shared values and ethics is more important than competence when they are deciding if they want to trust you or not. Okay? They want to know your shared values. What do you guys have in common? What do you have in common with the consumer? Chances are it's quite a bit. Go ahead. And so I call these bridges. This is what, if, you know, if I meet someone, it's not like I'm on a never-ending quest to spread the message of modern pig farming. But if there's an opportunity to get to know someone and that question never arises because they see you know, obviously, I've just put everything out on social media. But if they see that, we can, we can come together 
and determine what their actual question is, which is sometimes what you have to do first, um, but come together through, these are my bridges, this is what I, how I connect with people. Obviously everyone has family. Motherhood, my kids, cooking and baking is a great one. If you want my cinnamon roll recipe, you know, you can't be bashing gestation crates. Don't do that. I talk a lot about, not really CrossFit, but a lot about youth. But having those connecting pieces with the people I'm interacting on social media with or in person is vital. So think about that for yourself. Go ahead. So to kind of wrap up, the table of advocacy I like to talk about is a big, think of a big Thanksgiving table, okay? And let's say that it's, that it's right here and we're lined up all the way down and that's one door to get in, okay? That's where the food comes out. Now there's people in advocacy, so we're gonna make a parallel here, who wanna sit by the door where the food comes in, get, get the food first, tell people how much they can take of the rest and keep passing it down. There's people in the middle who just kind of mind their own, keep passing the food, take a little direction from here, go ahead and have this, and there's people at the end that are just happy to get anything. And when I talk about advocates that jump out and are super defensive about anything that comes up, we have to have everyone, mm -hmm. and I understand that. But those defensive people kind of sit at the front of the table, and the rest of us, me included, are kind of sitting at the back. You know, let's just let's just share a story, let the bad stuff fly around. And I, for one, am a person that doesn't really recognize a ton of it. You know, if something really hits home, I'll write about it. Um, but just keeping consistent with sharing what's important to you and your family on your farm is the number one goal. And what I like to do the most is show things, not tell them. I never want to educate. I'm going to educate you about something. I just show little, uh, little snippets of my daily life. So this is during harvest, corn harvest, you can see. I am riding with my son who, my dad also does never throw anything away. Have you, raise your hand if you have seen this print on a couch. Did everyone get that couch in the late 90s or what? Yeah, you know. So the couch goes to Goodwill, but my dad keeps toilet seats. He keeps old pillows. So I just ran and grabbed that pillow and my son decided that he would take a nap. And off the record, later on, you know, there's tons of tile ditches through this field. He actually bounced over. And this is, do you see my boot right here? This is actually the clutch. And I did slam the clutch down right on his face. So that, that was one of those things. <laughs> that I didn't show, yeah. But self-deprecating enough that, you know, nobody's perfect. I show how I fail all the time to my readers. It, it it makes you relatable and people want to believe you. They want to see you screw up. They want to see me gain 15 pounds because I'm working on a cake recipe. They want to see me mess up. Because if there's cake, trust me, I'm eating it. Cake or pie, raise your hand for cake. Raise your hand for pie. Ugh. I'm a, I'm a pie person too, but whatever. I always have to ask when it comes up. So yeah. Full disclosure, never really made that on social media, but this, um, I do like to show things. It's so easy. When I have a blog post, I grab five pictures of whatever, and I write based on the pictures that I took. It's so much easier. So much easier. Go ahead, Carrie. And just so you know, all yeah, this is our awkward family picture with Chris Souls. I just like to put that up because people love to make fun of it. He's a very nice person. Great help for our um, pig friends, but the best part of any of being an advocate for me is to meet people like you. And you will meet them from far and wide, and they are all there to help you. And if you walk out of here today and you decide, man, I'm ready, I'm ready to do this, I want to try at least. I can tell you the second your email hits my inbox, I will help you. I'm here for you defend you against the trolls because there are vegan activists out there that see you know your pictures of your kids and pigs and they you know act stupid about it but 
I just block them, whatever. But we are all here for you. These two girls up in the front row, they're here for you. You have the best team. Don't tell the pig people I said that. You have the best team to help you carry your message because it is important. Because if you don't tell your story, who's going to tell it for you? And they are out there telling it their way right now. That sucks, doesn't it? Does that burn? Ugh. But if you don't, if we don't have enough of the good things that happen on farms, if we don't show enough of the good and the great people, and, and you know, maybe it's your, your local cattleman's went and volunteered at, at an event, uh, a shelter event to feed the homeless. That's still important. That's still things <coughs> worthy of sharing. Showing that we, like, come on in ladies if you'd like. Yeah, showing that you're still people is really the goal of what we want to accomplish. Go ahead, get that off of there. And I don't know if I've empowered you at all to think that you are worthy of sharing this information, but this is another great quote. The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any, but you do. Every single person in this room has a lot of power to be able to share that story. This guy does, but this girl has to do it for him. And I think he'll keep it that way for a while anyway. One more, I think. Are you going to? This is from Abby Martin from Martin Cattle Company. I just love it, you know. It's just breaking. I don't know if this is AM or PM, but either way, it's either super early or pretty <coughs> darn late, and you're still working. And th but this is normal to you. What's not normal to you is the people that get off work at 3.30. What do they do when they go home? They pick up three piles of dog doo-doo in the yard, and then they get to go sit on the couch. They might even get to read a book or get their laundry done so it's not heaped in a pile in front of their dryer. <laughs> Guilty admission. Um, but will you? Will you step up and tell that story? I think this is the last one. Yeah. Because it's this that we want to protect for our families what's really important we have to protect it and we have to tell our story before other people want to try to tell it for us all right so boring parts over now let's cook Carrie do you want to help do you want to be involved okay <laughs> I know I better okay just sit down for a while so <laughs> Favorite cut of the bovine animal? Raise your hand if it's the ribeye. Okay. What's second place? Somebody shout it out. I want to know. Filet. Filet. Yep. All right. Anything Flat else? Brisket. Flat iron. Brisket. Oh, ho, ho. we could have done a lot. We could have done a lot. Well, today is my birthday. Oh, thank you. And <clears throat> so last night, I should kind of tell the story. What time is it? I don't want to be up here jabbering for too long. Sweet. You have to be on the radio at 11.30. I have to be on the radio? Yeah, just to let you know that. Okay. With Bob? Who is, figure it out. So. Um, okay, I have to be on the radio at 11.30. Whatever, let's get this started. <laughs> so last night I'm sitting in my chair. I'm traveling with a girlfriend of mine, Erin Brenneman from Brenneman Pork. They recently had a barn fire. And her husband is not able to attend the Pork Action Group meeting down in Florida, so I am leaving. Don't tell my kids. They have no clue. They freak out when I leave. I'm leaving to go to Florida tomorrow, so I'm sitting, looking at my Christmas tree, thinking about what I'm going to do all day today, and Katie Altoff with Cattlemen's calls me and says, emergency, emergency, what are you doing tomorrow? And it was one of those moments where, well, I have 10,700 things to do tomorrow, but what do you need? <laughs> so that's why I'm here, and the chef that <coughs> ditched out is still at work or doing whatever so for my birthday every year we always go out for birthday steaks when I was little you know that was a super super big treat and it still is for me and for our family um, to get to go to a restaurant and have birthday steaks and the most memorable birthday steak I've ever had was a ribeye that actually came to me with a sizzling hot 
pad of compound butter on it. Compound butter is when you take butter and mix it with herbs, spices, whip it all together. Usually you can spread it in like a parchment liner like this, roll it up, and then you can dress the already fried up ribeye with it or serve that little disc to let it melt as the person, you know, it arrives to the table. So seriously, you better get hotter than this. Come on. This is a new, thank you, Brooke, a new hot plate. So we're going to see how it goes. But does anyone cook their steak? So birthday steaks is what we're going for today. I know the chef was going to talk about the roast, making a roast and roasting. This is kind of along the same lines. Does anyone cook their steak inside? You do. Good. Perfect. Yeah. On cast or another surface? Yep. Yeah. So, perfect. So we have um, the situation at my house. It's like we are on the Serengeti. We live on the top of a hill and we just need more cover. We don't have tree, mature trees that are big enough, and this time of the year, it's super windy, and we can never get the grill to light, and I just don't want to hear it from my husband, so I kind of take over. Um, when I go to make, and this is almost my preferred method of, I think it really celebrates a meat, okay? I love ribeye on the grill, don't get me wrong, but I super, super, super love getting a great sear, and I hope we can do that, but the the heat that's radiating off of this pan isn't quite a lot right now, so we're just going to wait it out. Um, I hope we can get a good sear because that's most important. But it allows, does anyone have a digital instant read thermometer? Yeah? Does anybody have a thermopen? Yeah. Hey. What color is yours? Just nice. Oh, God. There's cake pieces on it. <laughs> I do. I temp everything. I temp my dinner rolls, 185. I temp cakes, banana bread. Who makes sogged out banana bread? You pull it out and you're like, oh God, it looks done. It looks so amazing. Oh my gosh, it's awesome. And then you cut it later and it's got this big, nasty, gooey. Well, you probably like that part. You're looking, you give me that look. But uh, I use these things for everything. You know, I actually take my kid's temperature with it too, but I try to wash it. I'll pass this around. So this is the Thermapen if you don't have one of these. Now, there are a lot of good digital instant reads on the market. These are the best, the most superior, in my opinion. I've had them all, and all the rest of them are in the garbage. And if it, if it times out, if you just shut it, you can turn it back on. So right now, it's, it is 79 degrees out side in here I mean which explains why I'm so hot under my arms How much is it? this retails for about 90 to 100 bucks but this is called the thermo pop now this will you can do candy with it you could like do toffee and all that kind of stuff you know when you're cooking sugar to a higher temperature this is cool with that up to 500 some degrees if you get something that hot you're gonna start your house on fire so <laughs> it doesn't really matter but three second read time. So you stick this in, we stick this in to that ribeye, we're going to be able to tell right away. This one takes closer to that five to six second level. It will not go up as high in degrees, but it retails for, you know, if you're just doing meat or bread or cake or whatever. Oh, and this says, hmm, 78 and 81. This is about 30 bucks. So you still get all the goodie out of it. I'll just pass these around because I just love them so much. And it's a great gift idea. It's one of those things that you don't think you really need, but you need it. And once you have it, you will never do anything ever again without it. Burgers, okay? Oh, we might be able to, we might be able to, it's getting warm. Yeah, it's warm. It's warm. It's warm. Can you smell that cast? It'll just need to work for a while. So what we'll do right now is actually make the compound butter. Has anyone had, so like honey butter, cinnamon honey butter, has anyone made that before? Yeah? Oh gosh, it's like frosting, right? I actually put powdered sugar in mine. Is that the worst thing you've ever heard? It kind of is frosting. 
I love to bake dinner rolls. I love to bake bread. If you have pie, bread, whatever questions for me, save them up. I will stay on, answer everything for you. Oh no, Carrie, where's my big knife? Here it is. So typically what I would do is saute these cloves of garlic a little bit first just to kind of get that super ooh, garlicky, raw, almost hot taste out. Um, today I'm not going to do that. Just wanted me to power, do you want me to do that again? Do you get it? <laughs> now this is the time where I don't want to cut my fingers in front of you guys. It's been known to happen. This is, you got to have a good knife. Oh, you got to have a knife that doesn't have a greasy handle. What's that? These are just Cutco knives. Hold your knife right, you guys, please. Wrap your little knuckle around it right there. It gives you really good control. Okay, wrap your hand. If you have big hands like me, you got to make sure there's plenty of clearance right here when you have a chopping knife. Because if you're, you're not going to be able to get your hand around it. Okay? So we're just going to kind of, we want to mince this. We'll chop. Try not to chop our finger off. Actually, you know what I did bring is this. This little microplane. Does anyone have these? This should have been titled the, like, good job, good. Got it all. The gift giving seminar. Come on in, Jerry. We're waiting for you. Did you bring the whiskey? <laughs> it's getting hotter. So I want that screaming hot because I want to be able to set that ribeye on there, have a really nice sear, that Millard response when the proteins and sugars in, in the protein and the sugars in what we're going to dress our meat with caramelize. And that gives us that brown, really good flavor. So then we flip it over again, another two minutes. What I do at home is have my oven preheated to 350, okay? Chefs usually preheat to 450. Once you sear two minutes, two minutes, throw it in the oven, okay? 350 gives me a little bit more swing and not having to check it so often because at 450 to 500 degrees, that roasting period of when your steak is in the oven finishing its cooking time goes a lot quicker. So I throw it in at three, it's done eight to 10 minutes, rare. Um, so today, since we don't have the oven to go into, we're gonna just try to do this so we can just at least get these bad boys cooked at all. Sound good, okay. So sear, sear, two minutes, two minutes, and then we would go into a 350 for eight to 10 minutes, eight for rare, 10 mid rare to medium, 12. You know, you can just keep climbing, but luckily you've got your thermopen. All you have to do is pop your little oven open, stick it in there, and the very tip of that probe is what gets the temperature, which is awesome. Just stick it right in, it'll tell you, give you the read. You can shut everything back up if you need to go longer, okay? No more guesswork, none of this. Well, if you pinch here and here, this is what that should feel like. Have you ever done the, that deal? If you're not a chef and you're not touching 75 steaks a day, every day, I don't know how people do that. I don't think I could eat enough meat to be able to even be good at that, let alone full muscle cut like a steak. So let's just, I'm just gonna actually chop this up so we can have just a little garlic. This is gonna be some Hot garlic, holy buckets, I can smell it. And then I will take, so you don't want, you know, if you make salad dressings or anything like that, you never really want like big old chunks of garlic in there, right? No. I mean, if you do, perfect, more power to you. What I like to do is actually get the salt open, is take the salt that I'm gonna use in the recipe, and we are going to chop it into the garlic and then kind of mash against it. And what it does is it breaks some of that garlic down into more of a paste. And it assimilates into the butter just a little bit better. So we'll leave that there for a second. That garlic is just 
going to kind of tenderize a little bit under the influence of the salt and it's just going to be able to be whipped into the butter a little easier. So does anyone do beef and rosemary? Yeah, okay. I do too, I prefer it with bay, but how are you gonna like have a bay influence and in, you know, like little crunchy hard leaves and with butter, ew. I also like thyme, but all my thyme is dead on my porch herb garden. <coughs> so we've got our butter, it's a little chilled. I usually like to have it kind of warmed up a little bit so it's easy to mash around. <coughs> oh, guys are making my tongue tick or my throat tickle. So this is rosemary. Isn't it pretty? It was outside on my deck. I don't know how it's not dead. I have no idea. None. But it's not. And it's gorgeous. And it smells great. And if you want the rest when you're rolling out of here, take it. Okay, I'm just going to use a little bit. Because it's super duper strong, you don't want to have a ton of it. Now, does anyone put this in their crock pot? In their crock pot, okay? Do you chop it up before you put it in? Oh, that's a good, that's a good idea. Yeah. So what I do is take this whole sprig, this whole branch of it, and I, especially when I'm doing pork, it's almost like it gets an aromatherapy bath. So I'll just lay this gently on top of whatever roast I have in the crock pot and it perfumes the roast without having to pick these out of your teeth after you've made it later. So I just carefully lift it back out and discard it. It'll look old, dry, and dead, but its flavor has been surrounding your roast the entire time. My mom does a lot with rosemary, and it's just not a pleasing oh, mouth flavor to get a big, well, have a Christmas tree in your mouth. It's pretty much what it tastes like. So <laughs> pull it back out. Oh, my gosh. It's going to happen, you guys. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, so now this is super pasty, which is what everyone's going to say when they see my legs at this trip to Florida. Oh, my gosh. Seriously, so we'll throw that in there. My hands are going to smell like garlic for seven days. That will be awesome too. Okay, we'll give this rosemary a nice chop. I feel like a giant. I feel like a giant chopping on this little table. I feel terrible for my dad. My dad is six nine, right? So. Everybody thought, my mom was buying me like size 13 shoes when I was in third grade because they were on sale and she knew I was going to be that big, okay? Well, my feet are size 11s, they're huge, but we used to play games with his shoes, drop them from upstairs to downstairs off the steps and see who was the loudest. And the wingtips were always the loudest. They're size 16. I mean, my God, you could sail to Cuba in one of them. <laughs> but... Uh, when I, when I do stuff like this and, and I'm always bending over, I think, my God, oh. And, and then I just say, no wonder why he got rid of the pigs when he did. My husband's like this short little guy, right? My dad's super tall. Um, but my dad did have pigs long ago and he got rid of them. Too much bending over. Too much. All right, so that's all we're going to do. We're not going to over carry. Guess what? You get to smash this all together and then I'll look at it. So you would stir, stir, stir this up, right? And then, and I think there's enough salt in there. And then we would put it on one of those little parchment rounds or cling wrap and roll it up so it looks like a sausage, right? If you want to slice it. If not, don't worry about it. Just leave it just as is. Smash it up. Make sure it's even. This is your first test. Don't fail it. Okay? So, Peanut oil, yeah. you did it, Brooke. All right, so when I want to go, would you like to come in and sit down? You sure can. If, okay, you're good. So when we're talking about, oh, it's getting so close. I want to hover my hand over here and actually have to move it back a little bit because whew, it's getting hot. It's not there yet, but we are, we're going to be close enough in a little bit. Okay, It just takes a while for that castor to get hot. 
we don't want to, you know, you think, oh, butter just tastes so good, though. We should be frying in butter, right? No, because there are, in this butter, are dairy solids. Have you ever melted a stick of butter? I hope everyone says yes, because if you're a guy and your wife melts the butter in your house, you need to get on it. Do you see what comes to the top when you melt butter are the dairy solids, those little white particles, okay? If you want to have more of a butter influence, go ahead and melt your butter, okay? Scrape off those dairy solids and then use that as clarified butter. Like if you're going to butter a loaf of bread after it comes out of the oven, it's much more beautiful if you have scraped those dairy solids out of there and it won't burn as much. Now, I'm not recommending that you do clarified butter even here. We want to do peanut oil because it has such a higher burning point. I just even hate to tell you this, but a couple of weeks ago, my smaller cast skillet, I was preparing some pork tenderloin strips for my kids. I just kind of left the oil over there. I'm, I'm preparing, you know, my husband's sitting down because it's, oh, what time's supper? You know, what are we having tonight? And I look over and the oil's on fire. Never leave oil unintended. Oh my gosh, so he's carrying this cast skillet outside and we have a, a deck that goes all the way down. It's like a walkout ranch. What's up? Oh, sure, sure, you're so kind. You're so, thank you so much. Awesome. The, how nice is that? Okay, so he takes that, drops, drops the cast seal down two stories. There was a flame 13 foot in the air, I swear. It was the scariest thing ever, ever in my whole life. Do not. That was canola oil. I should have been using peanut oil. It would have saved probably the cast skillet that's still on the ground outside. <laughs> I think the dogs went and at least drank all the oil. By the way, I don't think your butter master is going to be done by 11.30. Carrie, <laughs> come on. Okay, so here is what we've got. I'm going to use the better of the two ribeyes. So we've got a nice little ribeye here. I did, do you want me to, do you want me to hold this up? Yeah. I'll quit moving. Okay. I know, it's so awesome. And it is, it's looking really nice. We've got another um, specimen here that's actually, um, it's a strip trying to be a ribeye. And it was a night shift at Fairway, so this is kind of what you get. But obviously you guys know everything about selecting your cut. We don't have to go over that, thank goodness. And we're gonna work on this guy first. So what I'm going to do is just get a nice seasoning on him. Now, here's the deal. If you use something like a, does anyone know what Lowry's is? If you don't, you are not, you don't have a beating heart. <laughs> this is my seasoning of choice. However, it does burn. There are spices in here that will burn, okay? Usually, and even pepper. If you pepper before, you're gonna do something like this over high heat. Your, it could burn a little bit, so we're not going to use too much. But I want to have that good flavor, the good seasoning, and some of that brownness. Okay, the other thing, you can, you can use some of these chunkier Chicago steak seasonings. Lowry's is, that's what it feels comfortable to me, that's what's recognizable and it's delicious, so whatever. I eat it on everything. I should be here talking about Lowry stuff, not, you know, beef, geez. So, it's getting, it's close. I just keep stalling and just praying that I'm gonna burn my hand when I stick it over top. So here's what you would want. If you were at home, you were over gas, you were over your electric range, whatever, glass top, I don't really care. You would want to go one, two, oof, got to pull it off. Okay, that's how hot you want it to be. All right? Cool? So we're just going to go ahead and add our peanut oil, high burning temperature, so it's not going to, you know, be all burnt and nasty like olive oil would if we were using it for this. And plus, we don't want our steak to taste like olives. 
Who does it? The olive oil people really got on their game 10 years ago to, and promoted their products because everyone's like, well, do you have olive oil? Well, no, I have soybean oil, whatever. It's the same stuff and it doesn't taste like olives. That's what I don't want. If you're ever frying anything, use peanut oil, okay? That's just my two cents. Is it gonna smoke? Is it gonna smoke? Nope, okay. So the other thing that you should know, I'm super forgetful in the kitchen. How hot do you think this is right now? How many times have I grabbed one of those naked? Mm, don't do it. And every time you think about grabbing it, think of me and how stupid I am and how I do this. And then there you're carrying it and your children are at your feet and you're going, oh my God, you want me to drop this on your head? No. Okay. We got to get that rolled around. Okay, there we go. Perfect. All right, so we're going to add this. Oh, my God. Please make a sexy noise. Please make a sexy noise. Do you want to get this? Are you going to do you? Okay, it's going to probably splatter. Woo! Okay, so two minutes. Who's my timer? Or should we just all count together? One, two. Okay, so we've got that first ribeye down. And there must be a gradual slope to this table because all the oil's kind of pooling at the one end. So if you have a slope to your oven, please consider this. You, you wanna make sure that oil is kind of getting in there. Here we'll do. We'll do a little picture of this. So this, this bad boy is gonna be on there for two whole minutes. Video. This is social. We are now social. No, you did? Oh, oh, it's only 26. Tell Bob not to get his panties in a wad. All right, who's got my timer? Okay, so let us talk about <laughs> two minutes, two minutes, going into the oven, pulling out, resting period. You all know what that is, right? We don't have to go over that. Letting that steak rest, hang on to all of its juices. Sure, it's going to be juicy and maybe bleed out just a little bit, whatever. And what temperature do you want this done to? And who has my thermometers? You do. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Do you want to come up close? Do you want me to get you a closer look at the? Oh, you're snapping! Nice. I love Snapchat. Ten seconds. Ten seconds, and then we'll flip. So this is super, like a super thick piece of meat, right? Let's just peek under there. <coughs> Be official. I usually just use a fork. Okay, so we're. We're good. We're going to just leave it a, just a little bit. It's not as hot as I'd like it to be. And if you want this recipe on my Facebook page, Food and Swine, a, Food Ampersand Swine, you know that weird and symbol? <laughs> I just thought it was cool when I branded that way. I don't know if it was the right decision. I do have this blog post will be my first edition. So you could go to foodandswine.com and find it that way, but you'll have to search or just go to my Facebook page and you'll be able to see it. Come on. Get that oil under there. <clears throat> Burger. Oh, you've, you're, you're good. You're good. You want to take some pictures for me? So there's your butter. Mm. I love to make bread that actually has chopped rosemary in it, like focaccia bread and stuff. Okay, so the reason I'm letting this go a little longer is because we obviously, I, it feels like an oven in here because it's 80 degrees and everybody's sweaty, even if you don't want to admit it. But we kind of got to cook it a little longer, okay. Pan frying steaks is awesome, but sometimes you can really get the outside portions super done and that middle can still be really red 
Um, that's why I like to have those steaks at room temperature when I'm doing this, so it's more of a smooth and even. All right. All right, so there's, there's your little ribeye guy right there, and we're gonna go ahead and flip him over. So that oil, you know, kind of makes a moist heat. When you're talking about, even when you get injured, you know, do you, you, oh my God, my back's out. The doctor says moist heat because it's more intense, right? The oil is making that heat that we're using a moist heat. We should probably get this other one going too. So I'm gonna wait a little bit on that guy because we obviously have to get him cooked through. Simple as best, you guys make a great product. So I don't want to put some blue cheese, gorgonzola, red wine, demi-gloss, this and that. No. Let's celebrate the meat for what it is. We're going to go ahead and get, get him in. We need more oil. So, are you trying to get like the oil splatter on my shirt or something? Yeah. So birthday steaks, huge celebration. The other time we got like a real restaurant steak during the year was after my dad would sell his calves in the fall and we would go to the Big Steer in Altoona. Yeah, anybody? Get a nice filet there and uh, always get a pink polar bear at the end of the night, but we got to get all dressed up and go out to eat. Those are the memories that are totally applicable if you want to step out and tell your story, why you celebrate the hard work that you do why it's important to teach your kids that. I'm glad I brought my big pan. Erger, you might have to finish cooking these too. So, Carrie. <laughs> you just want to know, who wants to guess? Closest person wins. I don't know what you're going to win. What's the temp on the inside of this piece of meat? What? 140 right now? 95. Crazy, huh? No. They were still they were still a little chilled. And I mean I'm running this hot plate as high as it can go. So that changes it up a little bit for us, but we're still going to eat anyway. Um, once this gets closer to that 115 buck 15, buck 20, I would go ahead and take, you know, either the chilled coin, put it on at that point, we're moving it off to tent and rest, and that chilled coin will melt. Um, right now, we've got a nice gloss. There's a really nice browning going on. If you put this butter in now, it's going to melt, and then you're going to have burnt dairy solids, burnt pieces of rosemary, burnt garlic in there. Do it. Don't do it. Okay, it's got to be super close to the time that you're ready to pull it out, pull it off. Do you guys have questions? I want you to ask me something. I feel like I've just talked at you. I was talking to Katie about, um, you know, when, when I meet people that aren't farmers. Yeah? How long do you let it rest? Uh, Five minutes. What, what's the recommendation okay. on a rest time? There. Ten minutes? Yeah, five, yeah, I would say five to ten, yeah, for sure. But tented, so you've got carryover cooking. I'm probably going to let these get to 130, just in case there's people in here that prefer a medium, medium well. You're going to carry over anywhere from, I say, five to eight degrees, depending on how hot everything is, what the temperature is in the room. So you're, if you want 140, you better be pulling off at 133, okay? And then you're going to tent with foil or <laughs> today... My aluminum foil box had actually parchment or piping bags in it. I picked out the box and I got here and looked and it's all little frosting piping bags. Like that's going to do anything when we're trying to rest our steak. So we're just going to put this guy over it, let it carry over to what we need it to, and just pray that this hot plate stays hot. What's that? Prime rib. So we smoke our prime rib. Yeah, in, in our smoker. Yeah, and it's just a mixture of salt, white pepper, and rosemary. 
I think my husband put a little bit of sugar in that rub last year and it really helped to get that the smoke cuts a lot of that sweetness and it wasn't much sugar but it really caramelized it was delicious and then you get that additional like red smoke ring kind of thing going on however it is not a traditional flavor you know some people the smokiness may be too much so use a mild wood if you're going to um, but if I was going to do prime I might roast it like this sear off all the sides and then you're going to go ahead and move it into your whatever pan you've got with your chopped vegetables to kind of when they reduce you can use that as, as almost a jus when you're done okay um, but the certified Angus beef people that were going to be here to tell you about the app called Roast Perfect um, that's an app that you can get Google Play or um, at the Apple the iTunes store to basically help tell you and determine how big of a roast we need for our party it you know kind of takes into consideration shrink how to prepare it how long you need to sear it and then how long in the oven it will need to be in there depending on how large of the roast that you got oh I see blood oh now what are we at 118 he said 120 good job okay how, what, what do you want me to stop at, you guys? You got to tell me. You want rare? Medium rare? Okay. And I want you to remember what I said is what I meant. If I can help you, if you want to learn how to share your story or would like to visit more, just send me a message. I would love to talk to you and I will be there to help you out. No problem, for sure. It was, it was so fun to be here with you guys today. Thank you so much.